Let's finish the book. There's about seven more pages to go. This wraps up what Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah has to say about jihad so that we get a full understanding of how this is applied in the real world should Sharia law become the law of the land, which is why we need to let people know about this. We need to discuss it. We need to refer to the most authoritative scholars, the most authoritative books, the most authoritative scriptures, allowing random Muslims to define Islam for us and define these terms like jihad for us is not beneficial. They're either misled or they are misleading deliberately. They're lying. We can refer to this and we can make sure that everyone understands this is what the facts are. This is the truth. Let's go on. Now, it speaks of in these couple of paragraphs here about not killing women and children. I think, okay, well, fine. That's that's standard international law. That's basic rules of warfare in any civilized nation. And they speak of it here, although in different Sharia manuals, in different contexts, they certainly do allow the killing of women and children. And often there are rules, not necessarily spoken of here, that allow for that to happen given this circumstance and that circumstance, or whatever the case might be. There are references to, well, yeah, go ahead, kill them. Muhammad allows it in different circumstances as well, but that's not what we're discussing. I have discussed some of those in different episodes. Look at Jan Irvin. The Unspun podcast, I speak about jihad in one of those episodes. I actually go through some of that information. Also, my most recent episodes with Jan Irvin on the Unspun podcast, I speak of the definition of jihad. I use two different Sharia manuals, and we go through instances where they certainly say, go ahead, kill the women and children if you need to. But there's a, a somewhat more practical reason for them not killing the women and children. Let's have a look. Let's start here. This is the Reliance of the Traveler, section 0913. When a child or a woman is taken captive, they become slaves. The woman's previous marriage is immediately annulled. Hence, as I discussed in my Unspun podcast, go back, I think it's Unspun 182, where I discuss jihad from the Sharia. This means that they become the property of the Islamic State. They are valuable. They can be sold. They have value. They can be traded for money. They can be used for work. And in fact, the women can become sex slaves. This is the more practical reason why the women and children are not killed, because they have a use. Notice the term fitna. Here on page 29, this is that fitna is more grievous than slaying, than killing. Fitna is more grievous, is worse. Fitna is worse than murder. Fitna is worse than killing unbelievers. Fitna, if we look here in the Reliance of the Traveler in this index, fitna falls under temptation. We've done this before, but let's, it's worth repeating. Fitna is a test of belief. Temptation, in other words, a test of your belief, a test of how committed you are to your belief. Where any uncertainty may mislead the subject, where steadfastness is sustained by Allah's mercy. Fitna has connotations of seduction and temptation. Something that may mislead a Muslim and take him away from his Islamic faith is so evil that it must be killed. This means that although there is evil and abomination in killing, there is greater evil and abomination in the persecution of the unbelievers. They don't mean it's evil to persecute unbelievers. It means that it is worse to be persecuted by the unbelievers. But this persecution means that they tempt you away from the faith by things like, I don't know, rock music, movies, makeup, short skirts, things of that nature. That is an abomination. That is persecution of the believers, the Muslims. And it is better that you kill them than that you allow them to continue with this abomination. While not strictly relevant to this discussion, they do mention innovation or bidda. Innovations are things that are added to the Quran or added to the Islamic practice, the ijma, to the consensus that are not in compliance with the Quran and the Sharia. This must be punished as well. Things have to be fully in compliance. I do discuss that in one of my other shows, I think on the Reasoned Answers channel. Let's have a look at this entry on page 29. The Sharia enjoins fighting the unbelievers. What does enjoin mean? Let's have a look at that, since that is also a legal term. Let's have a look at dictionary.com. To enjoin means to prescribe a course of action with authority or emphasis. Two, to direct or order to do something. Enjoin, to direct, require, command or to admonish. Enjoin connotes a degree of urgency. Very interesting. Enjoin for a court order that someone either do a specific act. Okay, let's have a look at another example. Let's see what Merriam-Webster says. To direct or impose by authoritative order or with urgent admonition. 
All right, let's have a look at the final one from Lexico, UK Dictionary. To enjoin is to instruct or urge someone to do something. It is to prescribe an action or attitude to be performed. Right, that's four different dictionaries. So the Sharia prescribes, it urges, it enforces. It's a legal command to fight the unbelievers. Now, it does continue here, but not the killing of those who have been captured. Well, because that is booty, that is war booty, and that is worth money. There's value there. If a male unbeliever is taken captive during warfare, otherwise as a result of a shipwreck, or because he lost his way, or as a result of a ruse, in other words, he was deceived or misled, the head of the state, the imam, I always thought the imam was just the head of the mosque, but it seems that the imam is the head of the state, may do whatever he deems appropriate, killing him, enslaving him, releasing him, or setting him free. But not the killing of those who have been captured. Killing him. But not the killing of those who have been captured. Killing him. Yeah, yeah. But not the killing of those who have been captured. The Imam can kill him. You figure that one out for yourself. Now, this is the view of most jurists, and it is supported by the Quran and the Sunnah. In other words, there are four options, and killing them is mentioned first. There are, however, some jurists who hold that the options of releasing them or setting them free for a ransom has been abrogated. So there we go. So setting them free for a ransom has been abrogated. As for the people of the book, they are to be fought until they become Muslims or pay the tribute, the jizya, out of hand and have been humbled. Let's take a step back a moment and just go back. Some jurists hold that the options of releasing them or setting them free for a ransom has been abrogated. Let's have a look at the Sirah of Muhammad, which is the biography of Muhammad. This is the oldest one, the most known one, the most used one. Allah said, it is not for any prophet to take prisoners from his enemies until he has made slaughter in the earth, i.e. slaughtered his enemies until he drives them from the land. You, and he's speaking to Muhammad here, desire the lure of this world, its goods, and the ransom of the captives. But Allah desires the next world, killing them to manifest the religion, which Allah wishes to manifest and by which the next world may be attained. That's the word of Allah to Muhammad. Allah wants Muhammad to make slaughter. He wants his enemies, which are the non-Muslims, the Kafir, to be driven from the land the way that the Christians and the Jews and the pagans were driven from Arabia or forcibly converted. And Muhammad desires the lure of this world, its goods and the ransom that captives would bring. But Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion. You will hear in um, Islamic apologetics, or should we say polemics, where they speak of, well, you know, Jesus was tempted. Oh my gosh, how bad is that? The Bible says Jesus, yeah, he was tempted, but he never gave in to temptation. He never sinned. Muhammad gave in to sin. Muhammad is lured by this world, by the things of this world. Money, ransom, slaughter, killing, power. Muhammad was actually lured. Muhammad was tempted. Muhammad is tempted. And Allah wants killing of these people to manifest Islam. So let's continue. So the people of the book are to be fought until they become Muslims or they pay the tribute out of hand and have been humbled. Now, if a rebellious group of Muslims, people belonging to Islam, refuse to comply with clear and universally accepted commands, being the ijma, the consensus, the Islamic consensus, all Muslims agree that jihad must be waged against them in order that the religion will be for Allah in totality. How do you know that you are the right group of Muslims, that you are doing it right? Well, there's the Sharia for that. But again, this means that if someone isn't complying with what is written in the Sharia, they must be attacked, they must be fought, violently subjugated and brought into line. This is not about discussion. This is about violent warfare. Has the Messenger of Allah not said, I have been ordered to fight people until they profess that there is no Allah, that's a typo, no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is Allah's Messenger? Challenge, show me where in the Quran we find the Shahada, that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his Messenger. Please let me know what page that's on, because it's not in there. Also show me where the instructions for the five daily prayers are to be found in the Quran, because they are absolutely not in there. They are in the Sharia. They're not in the Quran. So the Quran is incomplete. The Quran is not a book that contains enough 
to be a Muslim that contains enough to practice Islam. All of those things. So it's odd that Muslims will reject certain things and say, yeah, but I accept this and I accept that. But so do they accept the five daily prayers? Yeah, do they do they believe in the Shahada? Yeah, well, it's not in the Quran. So what's your authority for accepting that? But of course, if they say that, if they say the Shahada, if they believe in Islam, their lives and their properties will be safe. So if you become a Muslim, your life and your property will be safe. If not, you'll be fought and killed and your things will be taken from you. Unless though, and here's, <laughs> unless there is a rule of law that allows taking them. So they can go back on that rule. Very interesting. And Umar said, I realized immediately that Allah had opened his heart for fighting. And I knew that that was right. There you go. So Allah has opened his heart for fighting. Allah wants warfare. Allah wants slaughter. And now they speak of new groups to emerge in the future. They will abandon the religion. Wherever you find them, you must kill them, since those who kill them will be rewarded on the day of resurrection. So if Muslims find new Muslims who are not following Islam correctly, kill them, and you'll earn a reward from Allah for that. This should explain the turmoil in the Middle East. Islam is just quarrels, warfare, slaughter with borders. They say this again here, they will abandon the religion if the army that reaches them would know how much reward the Prophet has promised them, and that's for slaughtering the people that abandoned Islam, the apostates. They would rely on this deed alone and not worry about other good deeds, because slaughter leads to the highest reward in Islam, a guarantee of paradise. That's Islam. That's Islamic theology for you right there. In another version, they will fight the people of faith. I shall kill them. If their own people then want to become idolaters, they shall be killed. And again, my community will fall apart into two parties. And this is by Muslim, Sahih Muslim. The party that is closest to truth will be in charge of killing them. How do you know which party is right? So the party that is closest to the truth will be in charge of killing them. Okay, so, so yeah, if you disagree with Islam, if you disagree with Muhammad, if you want to bring change, bidda, to Islam, you must be killed. Now, some people just don't quite roll over and play dead. They might fight back. And there you go. That's the Middle East. It has been established on the authority of the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus of the community. That's the Islamic consensus, the Ijma, which is effectively contained in the Sharia, that those who depart from the law of Islam must be fought, even if they pronounce the two professions of faith. And they make no qualms here. They are speaking of those who leave the religion. Those are apostates. It is allowed to fight people for not observing unambiguous and generally recognized obligations and prohibitions. Again, found in the Sharia. So if someone's not a good enough Muslim, fight them, kill them. It is obligatory to take the initiative in fighting those people as soon as the Prophet summons with the reasons for which they are to be fought has reached them. So you're, again, this is in compliance with previous statements. If you have been reached with a message that says, become a Muslim, comply with Islam, abandon your old religion, or become a dhimmi, pay the jizya, pay the tribute. So if that message has reached you and you fail to comply, then you must be fought. And of course, Muslims must take the initiative in fighting. This is not defensive. This is offensive. The most serious type of obligatory jihad is the one against the unbelievers. So now we see jihad is obligatory and it must be fought against unbelievers and also against those who refuse to abide by certain prescriptions of the Sharia. So there you go, that's why they kill Muslims, and that's why they fight the unbelievers, to make us adopt Islamic law, and to make sure that those Muslims who have said the Shahada stay in line. This jihad is obligatory if it is carried out on our initiative. The word defense doesn't appear in there. This is offensive Islamic jihad. If we take the initiative, it is a collective duty, which means fart kifaya, which means that if it is fulfilled by a sufficient number of Muslims, the obligation lapses for all others and the merit goes to those who have fulfilled it. I've covered this in my discussions of the definition, the legal definition of jihad in two different Sharia manuals. Such believers as sit at home unless they have an injury are not equal of the mujahideen, those who fight in the path of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Allah has preferred in rank the Mujahideen in the path of Allah with their wealth and their lives over the ones who sit at home. If they come back alive, they get a share of the booty, the spoils of war. 
and if not, they go straight to paradise. Allah has preferred the Mujahideen over the ones who sit at home. So those who do not participate in violent jihad are not equal in the sight of Allah. They are not at the highest level of Islam. The Prophet has ordered Muslims to help fellow Muslims, the assistance which is obligatory both for the regular professional army and for others must be given. Jihad is obligatory for all Muslims. They don't necessarily all have to go and fight because Fahd Kifaya says, or the communal obligation says, only some have to go out and make violent jihad. The rest may stay at home. As long as some are doing so a minimum number of times per year, the rest are allowed to not go on jihad, but must somehow contribute. Zakat, a portion of the Zakat, 818, goes to the support of jihad and other means. Again, I've covered this in previous discussions, previous episodes, and I've shown how that is defined within the Sharia. Support must be given according to everybody's possibilities, either in person by fighting on foot or on horseback, or through financial contributions, be they small or large. The former type of jihad, however, is voluntary fighting in order to propagate the religion. Oh my gosh, there we go. Voluntary fighting in order to propagate the religion. This is not defense. This is voluntary. So you can go out and impose Islam on the Kafir. To make Islam triumph and to intimidate the enemy. Well, this is very self-explanatory. This is jihad. As Muhammad practiced it and as defined legally within the Sharia. And this is now written by this man to explain this. So this, this is an exegesis of jihad from the Quran, from the Sunnah, into the Sharia. And now written out as a manual to assist those who want to fight in jihad. This form of punishment, i.e. jihad, I thought jihad was about, I don't know, having more salads, walking a dog, walking little old ladies across the street, being nicer to your grandma. Now we see it as punishment. Oh my gosh, I thought it was effort, struggle. No, it seems it's punishment. Either one of Islam's two dozen greatest scholars, a man with the title, the Sheikh al-Islam, is a liar, or he's wrong and he doesn't know what Islam is, and John Q. Random Lying Muslim in the comment section, he knows everything. Uh, which one do we believe? And uh, I personally say that the guy in the comment section is either ignorant or lying. I'll go with the major scholar of Islam. So this form of punishment, jihad, must be administered to rebellious people. And who's rebellious people? That's you. That's me. Right, this wraps this up. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. I have lots more that I want to make to make sure that people understand Islam from its fundamental text, from its greatest scholars. And I want to cover as well what Muslims learn from the age of five at the madrasas and also the fact that Islam is a Gnostic religion. When you go through the Sharia, you'd be surprised. Islam is Gnosticism. Not made public, not spoken about, but very much all over the Sharia manuals. Download them, read them for yourselves. And um, please, if you want to support, the links uh, down in the description. I would appreciate it. This takes a great deal of time and effort. My next project, once I complete and wrap up everything on Islam, will be to start discussing the lies that are told about the Bible. This is by Ibn Taymiyyah, answering those who altered the religion of Jesus Christ. I used to think Ahmad Dida was the man who made up most of this nonsense that they talk about the Bible and it's complete bogus nonsense. However, it goes back a lot further. The same guy who just wrote this wonderful book on jihad for us, he also explains just uh, what's wrong with the Bible and it's, it's nonsense. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful day. Goodbye.